we have a whopper of a solar storm on its way to Earth that's been part of a chain of solar storms that have been hitting Earth this week, plus a big radiation storm, plus ongoing big solar flares, and a whole lot of confusion in the media. Those stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.com edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week gets crazy busy. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we have a lot of active regions that have been firing big solar flares, but all eyes have been on region 3363. This region not only has been firing big solar flares, but it also has launched quite a few solar storms. Most of them have been kind of grazing Earth or just not having a big impact, but watch it right there late on the 17th. Wham, right there, that was a big M5.7 class flare. This actually gave us a massive radio blackout at the R2 level, and it also launched a big radiation storm that has now reached the S2 level and is continuing. As a matter of fact, it's gonna continue over the next day or two before things calm down. And the reason for that is because it has also launched a big solar storm. This is one of the biggest solar storms that we've seen of this solar cycle. And even though this region is almost on the sun's west limb, from coronagraphs, it sure looks like that solar storm is going to end up hitting Earth. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Meanwhile, it's not the only region that's been firing. Region 3276 has also been firing. We've got a solar storm that's gonna go off to the east doesn't look like it's going to hit Earth, but my goodness, the storms keep coming and we even have more on the sun's far side. As a matter of fact, as we take a look at Stereo's view, this is Stereo A and it's looking at the sun just a tiny bit from the side. You can take a look in the south and see region 3363 as it launches that big uh, solar flare and solar storm. You can see it takes a while for those loops to just kind of burn themselves out. This was just a, such a massive event, but believe it or not, this region is not the only one we're keeping an eye on. Because if we look to the sun's east limb in Stereo's view, especially in the north, there's another region. This is old region 3354 from the last rotation. We've been watching this region on the sun's far side. As a matter of fact, as we take a look at the HMI uh, Helio uh, Seismology far side viewer, you can see that really dark region. Look how big it grows as it continues to move across the, the sun's far side. Now, this region is definitely going to be a big flare player. We got a big some big flares from it the last time we saw it in Earth view, and it's just about to rotate into view and possibly be a big storm producer as well. Now, taking a closer look at that solar storm launch, we switch to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now, this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity. You're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. And as we take a look at that solar storm launch, you can see it looks like it's mainly going west of Earth, but we've got this grazing passage right uh, hitting Earth right about midday on the 20th. So we could get a little bit of storming from this from NOAA's perspective. However, as we switch to the NASA version of Enlil and their run, again, you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. You can see that solar storm coming off to the west of Earth once again, but not quite. As, as offset as it was in the NOAA model. It looks like we're actually gonna get a bit more of the flank hitting Earth, which means a bigger solar storm, plus it's coming faster. From the NASA version, which is a bit more optimistic, the solar storm will be hitting us basically late on the 19th. So the difference between the optimistic version of uh, NASA saying it's gonna hit late on the evening of the 18th or NOAA's version of the model saying that it's gonna hit midday on the 20th. Wow, that's almost about a 24 hour window that we've got there. So we've got both an optimistic and a conservative kind of bracketing of when the storm's gonna hit us. It's likely gonna be about a G1, possibly a G2 level solar storm. So we could definitely get Aurora down to mid latitudes. So it's definitely worth Aurora photographers for you to keep your batteries charged and keep your eye on the skies. Switching to our moon, 
We are now passing through the new moon phase, with the new moon being on the 18th. And by the 22nd, the moon will still be less than 20% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, like, I don't know, maybe some aurora, and possibly even the Perseid meteor shower, whose season is just beginning, well, now is your perfect chance. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the hit from that solar storm that was launched mainly west of Earth during that big M5.7 class flare back on the 17th and 18th. Now, this solar storm is moving pretty quickly, but because it's a glancing blow, we're not expecting it to last for all that long. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting uh, major storm conditions. As a matter of fact, we have up to about a 50% chance of a severe storm, but it's only going to be over the period of the 20th, and then things are going to go back to a minor storm condition and then settle back down. By the 22nd, we could be back to reasonably unsettled conditions. So aurora photographers at high latitudes, definitely get ready. This could be a wonderful show. And if you're really far north, you may actually have to look southward for the aurora. Now, as we take a look at mid-latitudes, well, the story is still pretty good. We are expecting uh, active conditions, well, likely going to be uh, minor storm conditions, but possibly up to about a 15% chance of a major storm. Now, NOAA's a little bit conservative on this. I would think we have a better chance to get a G2 level solar storm. That's the major storm conditions over the 20th. But things, once again, are going to settle down quite quickly. By the 21st, things could be back to active conditions and then back to unsettled conditions after that. But it is a big enough storm for aurora photographers, even at mid-latitudes. Get ready and be prepared because on the 20th, it could be a great show if that magnetic field orientation of the storm is aligned the proper way. Switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, believe it or not, with all of the active regions in Earth view, including region 3363, we are seeing some of the highest solar flux numbers we've had all cycle. We're sitting well above the 200s right now, and this trend is going to continue, and this means great radio propagation on Earth's dayside. However, with all this activity also comes a moderate noise on the bands. In fact, NOAA's giving us about a 55% chance of M-class flares at an R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and even a 20% chance of X-class flares at an R3 level radio blackout over the next few days. This is until region 3363 rotates to the sun's far side. But even after that, we have that new region that's going to rotate into Earth view, and that could keep those, not all of these numbers elevated over this next week as well. So we're just going to have to deal with the radio blackouts and amateur radio operators and GPS users be sure to stay vigilant on the Earth's day side and near dawn and dusk. Switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, we are dealing with the polar cap absorption event right now due to the ongoing radiation storm that's launched on the 18th by that big solar flare. Now, originally this radiation storm peaked at an S2 level, but we've managed to kind of come under those levels. We're now at an S1 level. In fact, we're sitting right now at the D2 minor range for you aviators, which again is the S1 level, and these conditions are going to continue over the next couple days until that solar storm passes over Earth. In fact, right on the 20th, we may actually peak back up at the S2 level for a short bit before things begin to calm back down. And by the 21st, NOAA's giving us about a 50% chance that we're still going to be above that S1 level, but things will calm down. So you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew and high-risk passengers, definitely take this uh, into account into your flight plans. And you pilots, especially if you're flying over those polar routes, be sure to check those ICAO uh, advisories often. And with so many solar storms being launched as of late and all these glancing blows, it's very easy to get things mixed up when it comes to forecasts, especially forecasts that are having to change quite often. And when you add on top of that long-range solar wind forecasts into the mix, no wonder so many people have gotten confused as of late. But here is a nice treat of a former student of mine and now friend and colleague to help set the record straight. Hello, my name is Vincent Ledvina. I'm a space physics PhD grad student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, making a guest appearance today to talk to you about the solar storm uh, that did not, but kind of did, um, arrive last week that did not, in fact, cause aurora seen in 17 US states. So what happened is that 
Um, NOAA's 27-day forecast predicted a KP of 6 based on old data, and then the University of Alaska Fairbanks Geophysical Institute, which is actually where I'm a grad student at, uh, we kind of have our own, um, we kind of take that 27-day forecast and put it into like this auroral oval simulation. So that oval highlighted 17 U.S. states, which is why you saw 17, the number 17 in all of these forecasts. And unfortunately, what happened is the NOAA 27-day forecast, anything after three days or even five days is pretty unreliable. And these 27-day forecasts will take what are called coronal holes. They'll take coronal holes that they saw last month and they assume that they'll be seen the next month after because these coronal holes last for a long time on the sun. So Noah said, okay, well, we had a KP6 at this last coronal hole. We, we should probably see a KP6 the next time around. Well, next time around, that coronal hole closed up, which means that that KP6, Noah said, nope, we're done. We're not going to have a KP6 anymore. They invalidated their forecast. Um, but the UAFGI's forecast still stayed up. So what really ended up happening was that the news sources weren't using the NOAA official forecast as it was being updated. That was a big issue and created a lot of hype around this Aurora event that was not going to happen. Well, it was funny because I'm an Aurora chaser and I do some you know, outreach online and I was telling people, hey, this isn't going to happen. But then all of a sudden the CME launched off the sun and I was like, well, I'm going to look like a fool now and all the news stations are going to look like they're the ones you know, getting it right. Ended up that the CME did hit, but it was pretty weak. And there was aurora that was seen, I think, as far south as like Washington, um, even central Idaho. I know some of my friends saw it in North Dakota and Minnesota. So there was aurora, but it just wasn't the KP6 that we were all expecting. And it was for a different reason than what was reported originally. So it was a whole chain of miscommunications. And it just goes to show you that you really have to get your sources from the right places. Thanks for my little cameo, <laughs> Dr. Scove. Appreciate it. So the space weather this week has definitely gotten exciting. We have a big solar storm that's going to give us a glancing blow, possibly late on the 19th and into the 20th, and possibly the 21st before things calm down. Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could definitely get a show. And even Aurora photographers at mid latitudes, you have a fighting chance to get a decent show, but it could be short lived. So you're going to have to pay very close attention. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, you're dealing with some a lot of radio blackouts on Earth's day side, and sorry, that's just going to be the way things are for the next week, possibly two weeks before things calm down, especially with the new region rotating into Earth view here over the next couple days. Luckily, though, region 3363 we're saying goodbye to, so in a few days that won't be an issue anymore. But then you also have to deal with uh, the big solar storm hitting Earth on the night side. So if you're on the day side of Earth and you get these radio blackouts, go to higher frequencies. If you're on the night side, when the solar storm hits, go to lower frequencies, and hopefully you can ride this thing out. And now G GPS users, well, things aren't looking all that great for you. Both the day side and the night side are going to be impacted here over the next couple days. So you're just going to need to stay vigilant, especially near dawn and dusk or anywhere near Aurora. And if you happen to be a drone pilot, be sure to calibrate your magnetometers often. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.